beautiful? Amen. Yes. We have to thank the Lord for his many blessings. Amen. And just as we try to beautify our homes and make our homes as comfortable as we can, we do the same thing here for the Lord's house. So thank God for his blessings. This was a long time in coming. Do you notice the logo too? My <laughs> gorgeous. It's beautiful. So before we begin also, I want to say that you are home. Amen. Amen. This is home. And I heard in the men's prayers about family and coming into a family. And so I hate goodbyes. And they make me very sad. But we're approaching a time when goodbyes will be no more. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Amen. Bible, 
I discover something that it hadn't been brought to my attention before. And so today we will do that. Okay? Um, God always provides, doesn't he? Amen. God always paves the way. <clears throat> Amen. And some of the songs that Annalisa um, had picked for us to start our worship service with, Seeking the Lost, these words stuck in my mind. It says, seeking the lost and pointing to Jesus, souls that are weak and hearts that are sore. You ever found yourself in that position? You ever been there when your heart is so full of ache and you're, you feel out of sorts, you feel so lost? Today we're going to talk about the woman at the well. And we're going to talk about her because the woman at the well, she lived like she was an outcast. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I believe you'd be lying if you said you've never found yourself in a situation similar to that. Many times it's through divorce. Many times it's through separations. Many times it's because of choices of our own that we find ourselves and feel like we are outcasts. So if you have ever been in a situation like that, then you can relate to the Samaritan woman today. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles now. We're going to go to uh, 2 Kings. And we're going to go to 2 Kings 17. And I'm going to read out loud from 26, actually I'm going to read from 24 through 28, okay, and I'm reading from the New King James Bible. I need to understand where, who the Samaritan woman was and what group she belonged to, okay? So I'm going to read out loud, starting at verse 24. It says, Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, from Cusath, Ava, Hamath, and then from Sepharvim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in the city. <clears throat> and it was so at the beginning of their dwelling there that they did not, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations have you have removed and placed in these cities, do not know the rituals of the God of the land. And therefore he has sent God's uh, lions among them. And indeed they are killing them because they do not know the rituals of the land. And I'm going to stop right there for now. Okay? So as far as we understand, the Samaritan woman belonged to th this group of people. Okay? So if you ever study about the Samaritans and you study about the woman at the well, you find that the Samaritans were a group of people in the Bible that lived in the area of Israel and it was following the Assyrian conquest. And this group of people were a mix of Israelites and pagan foreigners as well. And while they mixed, they retained many of their idolatrous customs. So they adhered to a religion that was a mixture of Judaism, but yet they idolized gods. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like Revelation? They were neither hot, they were neither cold. They were comfortable right there where they were. To the Jews, this group of Samaritans, they were a group of people that were not very desirable. The Jews looked upon them as a revolting people, a disgusting people. And they would have rather them be Gentiles or be pagans, either one, but not right in the middle. Mm. You have to remember, that the Jewish society at that time was a very legalistic society. And so they looked upon these people, they looked down upon these people. And so
So this is where the Samaritan woman belongs, okay? She belongs to this group of people. And the Jews did everything in their power not to come into contact with them, not even to cross them, okay? So here, this Samaritan woman, let's talk about her a little bit. The Samaritan woman, the Bible tells us, if you read the story, she had a colored past. She wasn't the purest of people. And she found herself drinking at the well with the Savior of the world. See, the Bible says what we just read, it says at the sixth hour she was at the well. And if you study, you find out that it's about 12 o'clock, 12-ish, when she went there. Now in Samaria, the weather was very hot. And she goes there at noon when there's no one else around. And custom was in those times that women went together as a group early in the morning to fill up their jugs of water. They didn't want to be out in the hot sun. So why does she go at this hour? Why does she go with her jugs to get water at this time? What did we say at the beginning? She felt like an outcast. She was an outcast. Have your circumstances ever made you feel like you were an outcast? Have you ever felt in your circumstances that people murmur about you? That people talk about you? They gossip about you? They avoid you? This is what she was going through. This was her life. She was a social outcast. And so she goes to the well in the middle of the day because usually there's no one around. Can you understand? Can you relate to her? Can you understand that she planned her day, she planned her life around people so that she could avoid them? She avoided being in crowds because she already knew what would happen. They would point to her, they would single, single her out, they would murmur, they would, the other women probably snickered at her because they felt they were superior to this woman who had a past, who had an actual life that wasn't an ideal life. So she goes to the, to the well to avoid the villagers, to avoid the other groups of people. And she comes alone every day and she sits there alone as she fills her jugs. But what happens today? Is she still alone today? She is not alone. She walks up and she sees a stranger sitting there. And as a human being, I can almost, almost see what she what was going through her mind. She probably walks up, sees the stranger there, and she talks to herself. Have you ever had moments where you talk to yourself and you're like, I can, no I can't, I will, I won't? And I think that's what she probably was going through. She sees the stranger and she thinks, should I run? Should I turn around? Should I walk away? No, I'm going to go. And so she walks up to the well. Because today she was not alone. She sees the stranger sitting there at the well, and she's probably thinking, I'm going to get my water, I'm going to fill my jugs, and I'm going to run back to where I go. How many times have you felt like, should I go, should I not, should I be around those people? Can I do it, can I not? Will they criticize me, or will they love me? And so this Samaritan woman, I think many of us, maybe all of us, can relate to her feeling like an outcast, can relate to her knowing that people treated her like an outcast, like something lesser than a human being. You see, this Samaritan woman, she lived in darkness, and she was lost in the darkness of her guilt and her brokenness as well. She was a broken woman, wasn't she? How many times have you felt broken? How many times have you felt alone? And, her, and in her erroneous thinking, in her erroneous belief, she believed that she was
was beyond redemption. She believed that she could never be anything else. I've heard many people say, I don't come to church because I, I'm a bad person. I don't come to church. I can't participate in things because of the things that I've done or the things that I continue to do. You see, like the woman at the well, we live in that darkness of our brokenness. We live in the darkness of our guilt. This woman, rather than facing reality, she lived the only way she could. She structured her day to avoid as many people as she could. And she stayed in the comfort zone of what was familiar to her. It takes courage, doesn't it? It takes so much courage to change, to decide today my life will be different. It takes courage. And that courage doesn't come by itself. It's not of our own doing. It has to come from the Lord, the courage and the strength to make changes in our lives. But she lived the only way she knew how, the only way that she had survived so far. And she remained in the comfort and the safety of her dysfunction. I do that sometimes. Sometimes I choose the safety I know instead of engaging in change. And yet she walks up to the well and there is Jesus sitting at the well asking this disgraced woman, this woman that everyone else saw as an outcast, a person that was no good. Here this stranger, Jesus sits and he asks her for some water. And I wonder again at that moment if she didn't think, is he talking to me? Does he want water from me? Does he know I'm a Samaritan? Does he know what I do, what I am? It would have been so easy for her to leave, <clears throat> to get up and walk away. And I wonder if I would have had the courage to sit there and endure whatever this stranger was going to say to me. It's difficult to be so overwhelmed by problems. It's so difficult to be overwhelmed by emotions that we take upon ourselves or that others influence us to take. And this is where she was. She was so overwhelmed by her life. She must have been so lonely because she was a social outcast. But she didn't run. The Samaritan woman stayed. The Samaritan woman stayed with a stranger. She didn't know who he was yet, but she stayed. And you know what the beauty of all of this is? The Savior didn't run away either. The Savior didn't turn his back on her. He sat there and he engaged her in a conversation. Do you think he didn't know who she was? Do you think he didn't already know she was an outcast? Do you think he didn't already know all the terrible mistakes that she had made? He knew. He knew. And he knows about me. He knows about you. And yet he stays. He does not turn his back on you or on me. He didn't turn his back on this Samaritan woman. That's who Jesus is. Amen. That is what Jesus does for you and for me. This Samaritan woman stays. She doesn't only stay, she listens and she talks to the stranger. That took courage from her, don't you think? A lot of courage. What are you willing to do? Jesus sits. He sits waiting for you to do the same thing the Samaritan woman did, to stay 
and to choose to listen to him and choose to talk with him. You see, this is an important point. He doesn't see where you've been. He doesn't see what you've become. And he doesn't do, he, he doesn't see even what you do today. And the Samaritan woman, he saw his creation. And when he looks at you and he looks at me, he sees his beautiful creation. He sees your worth. And he sees the beauty in which he created you. Psalms 139, 14, I'm sure we all know it. For I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. In Reflect and Revive, the last um, two weeks, we talked about identity. Who we are. And today, not any different than in the Samaritan woman's world, identity is difficult to accept, to recognize. Today we live in a world that is so confused. People that are so confused, so lonely, so ridden with guilt and brokenness. I work with young women that have eating disorders, that can't stand who they are, or how they look. You see, because through sin and through our environments, we all think we have to be something that we are not. But the thing to remember, what the Samaritan woman learned, is that Jesus was looking at his beautiful creation. And the next time that you're sitting there guilt written and sitting in your brokenness, remember, he doesn't see your brokenness. He sees his masterpiece, the beautiful being that he created. For I am wonderfully and fearfully made. I'm going to jump to verse 10. In verse 10 of John 4, it says, if you knew the gift of God, he, he tells the woman, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. That's what Jesus tells her. But she doesn't understand. But she is fascinated by this stranger. She is fascinated by his words, otherwise she would have left. And she says, sir, give me that water that you are talking about so that I will never ever again be thirsty or have to keep coming to this well to draw water. You see here, at this moment, can you see her thinking start to change? I imagine the wheels of her brain starting to turn and suddenly she chooses change over the safety of what her world had become. And she says, I know that the Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. A while ago, I told you that the Lord leads and he guides. The second song that we sang this morning, one of the stanzas says, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. See, if you don't believe that Jesus brings about change in your life and in your character and in who you are, just accept him. Come to him at that moment. And at that moment, you will believe that you have received a pardon from the Savior. So she suddenly changes her thought, her train of thought. She accepts that she can change now. She doesn't have to remain in the darkness that she's lived all along. If you read the story of the Samaritan woman, you understand that Jesus knew who she was. She knew, Jesus knew how many times she'd been married. She knew that the man he, he, she was living with now wasn't even her husband. You see, Jesus knows. He knows you. He knows me. 
And yet when he sees us, when he sees you, he sees the masterpiece that he has created. In the verses that we read at the beginning, I told you that when I read the Bible or read stories, I, under, I see things that catch my attention that haven't before. John 4, verse 4, it says, He had to pass through Samaria. I always just accepted that. Jesus knew where he was going. Maybe that was the only route. I never even thought about those things. But why did he have to go through Samaria? Why did he need to go through Samaria? Today, so that you have an understanding, Samaria is in what is now the northern west bank. And in that time, in Jesus' time, there were other routes he could have taken to get to where he was going. There were routes between Judea and Galilee, or even the Jordan Valley. Jesus could have taken other routes, but he didn't. Now you must remember, these Samaritans, these group of people, the Jews, didn't want to have anything to do with them. They looked down upon them. They felt they were dirty. They didn't want to come in contact with him. But what does Jesus do? He barrels right through Samaria. He sits at the well and he waits. Why did he do that? Why did he have to go through Samaria? Well, I'm going to share some scripture with you. I'm going to share three scriptures. Afterwards, if you want the scripture, you can ask me and I'll give them to you. Proverbs 19.21 in the ESV version says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And then 1 Timothy 2.4 says, Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Job 42.2 says, I know that you can do all things. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. This woman lived in darkness, as many people do today. And I understand that we also, without sharing with each other, because of the world we live in, I know that we have found ourselves in moments like that. So I want to share with you, how many of you have ever heard Rescue with Lauren Daigle? If you haven't heard it, you need to go research it and hear it. But I'm going to read the lyrics to you. Rescue, you are not hidden. There's never been a moment that you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. And though you have been broken and your innocence stolen, I hear your whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS. I hear your SOS. And I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true. I will rescue you. There is no distance that cannot be covered over and over. You're not defenseless. I'll be your shelter. I'll be your armor. I hear the whisper underneath your breath, and I hear the whisper, you have nothing left. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you, and I will never stop marching to reach you in the middle of the hardest fight. It's true, I will rescue you, I will rescue you. Amen. You see, I'm going to ask the same question again. Why did Jesus need to go through Samaria? In verse 39 of John 4, it says, Many of the Samaritans of that town began to believe in him because of the word of the woman who testified. She told people, here's this woman that was an outcast, that went to the well in the middle of the day, in the middle of the heat, to avoid the other villagers. And yet she runs back. I don't think she walked. 
And then she ran back. She was so excited. She ran back and she tells them, he told me everything that I have done. And he is offering me the living water. So why did he have to go through Samaria? 2 Peter 3.9 says, not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And we already know John 3.16. For God so loved the world. For God so loved you. And that is the reason he had to go through Samaria. Amen. Amen.